Luke 22, 19, 20 says, uh, Then he lifted up a loaf. You know, that's how they had bread. They didn't, you know, they didn't get pre-sliced bread back in Jesus' day. Did you know that? <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have those bread slices. They'd, in fact, they just broke it off, you know. They didn't even... But he lifted up the loaf, and after prayer and a prayer of thanksgiving to God, he gave each of his, his apostles a piece of bread, saying, This loaf is my body, which is now being offered to you. Always eat it to remember me. So Jesus said, Always eat it to remember me. And then after the supper was over, he lifted up the cup of wine. He lifted it up again and said, This cup is my blood of the new covenant I make with you. And it will be poured out soon for you all. This cup, this cup is my blood of the new covenant. Hallelujah. So I brought this up. This has just been on my heart. In fact, I, I preached it to, uh, we visited Gary and Cheryl Hauser, and I kind of preached it to them a little bit. And uh, they gave me the thumbs up, so I brought it today. I thought I'd just preach it today. But... Uh, <clears throat> We're studying the bloodline of a champion in the men's on Monday nights, and we're almost done there, and young adults going a little slower, you know. They're a little slow. I just kidding. I just kidding. Actually, actually, what happens is the young adult, these guys have studied the Bible, so we have a much deeper discussion about it. Not, to, not the, the, the men are, you know, we're a little different at the men's. Anyhow, that said, we have it at Zach and Victoria's house. It's been wonderful. So, uh, But uh, it just seemed good to me and to the Holy Ghost that, that I teach uh, again on it today, which is Communion Sunday. So if you heard it before, don't tune, tune me out. Stir yourself up. Because repetition is the way the things we hear becomes the thing we know in our heart. So I'm not afraid of repetition. In fact, sometimes I'm like, Lord, should I preach that over again? Because I don't think they got it. And I, I got a lot of pages here, but if you're quick listeners, we'll go, fast, you know, we'll go through it fast. Most of the time you're slow, so I have to take extra time. No, we're a quick understanding here, right? I don't know. I'm getting my smart alecky side. I got to put the flesh under. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. I believe with all my heart it's impossible to describe in words what the blood covenant will mean to you once you understand what it is. I'm going to say that again. I believe it's impossible to describe, to describe in words what the blood covenant will mean to you once you understand what it is. You see, in modern times, uh, has anybody ever seen anybody cut a blood covenant? No. I was born 1956, and I can tell you since 1956, I've never seen anybody except maybe us as kids yeah. become blood brothers. Yeah. I've never seen anybody cut a blood covenant. Anybody seen one? You know, I've been in Africa, I've been in the Philippines, in Africa they still practice that, but I've still never seen one. So uh, we, don't, we just, we don't know what they are. Uh, so we don't understand what blood covenants are. But listen to me. God has chosen the blood covenant as the method he deals with man. God chose the blood covenant to deal with you and me. So I think we should learn about it, don't you? Wouldn't it be good to know what it means? Because man, it will set you free when you know what it means. There is wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. Right? Come on, I thought somebody would break out singing that. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the... Come on. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Why? Why? Because he cut a covenant with that blood. Are you listening? You could say the blood of Jesus changed everything 
in the destiny of mankind. That's the truth. The blood of Jesus changed everything. The blood of Jesus will change everything in your life. You know, and I've said this before, but my mom, I mean, I, I didn't know anything about Jesus. The first things I was hearing out of her mouth when I came to the Lord was, I plead the blood over you. I plead the blood. It doesn't mean she's begging. It's pleading her case. I'm resting my case. I'm going before the Lord. Lord, he's coming to you by the blood. She knew a lot of stuff that I did, and she knew I needed the blood to be applied. Are you listening? So I believe the Bible. I believe this is the word of God. I believe that God created everything. It says he did in, in here. And I believe he created everything. He made man in his image and likeness. He put him in the garden on this earth. When he made the first Adam and the first woman Eve, they had perfect fellowship with God. He came down. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, Francine and I are out in my garden and we're harvesting the beans and all of a sudden God comes walking in. Ooh, that's a nice crop of beans you got going there. And just fellowshiped with them. Now, how's things going? How do you like this earth that I created for you? Hey, have you tried those apples yet? Are you listening? Are you listening? They had perfect fellowship. Perfect fellowship. And then, you know, they were deceived, was deceived. Adam, he really wasn't. He just, he just sinned. He disobeyed God. And when he did, they went from having perfect fellowship to being driven out of the garden. When, when, they, when Adam sinned, sin Sickness and disease, death came upon the planet. It wasn't God got made. The curse, it, it came upon the planet. Before that, there was, there, was, there was no sin. There was no sickness. There was no disease. And now their fellowship was broken with God. But listen to me. God's God... God's love for man never waned. God's love for us never, never failed. God had a plan to restore mankind to fellowship. Are you listening? We know the, that the Bible says the life's in the blood. So while we may not necessarily understand why it had to be a blood covenant God chose, we can know for sure that the blood covenant was the way God chose to deal with man. Are you listening? We know that the Bible is the written account. What is this book? It's the written account of God's redemptive plan for man. Are you listening? Is that what the Bible is? Who is Jesus? Our Redeemer. Who is Jesus? Our Redeemer. Right? Jesus is the Word made flesh, and that's where I was going with this. So this is God's redemptive plan for man. And guess, and what is this Word based on? What are the two major chapters, the two major books of this? The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And they are both blood covenant books. They're both based on the blood covenant. Are you listening? This is so important because this is what we do every time we take communion. We remind ourselves that I have a blood covenant with Almighty God. Are you listening? So, it's God's redemptive plan for man and the God's plan of redemption hinged on two covenants. The old and the new. They're both blood covenants that God initiated with man. The Old Covenant used the blood of animals as a substitute. Is that right? Said the Old Covenant used the blood of animals. We talked about the goat, the scapegoat last week. The Old Covenant used the blood of animals as a substitute, but the New Covenant used the precious blood of Jesus, God's own Son, as our substitute. Are you listening? I, you can... <clears throat> we know that after God discovered... 
that Adam and Eve had sinned, he killed some animals. Do you remember? They immediately knew, uh, they immediately knew that, hey, we're naked. And you know what they tried to do? What did they try to do? They tried to take some leaves and cover their nakedness. What do, what do we still do? We try to hide our sin. You know, isn't that true? We still try to hide. We still try to hide stuff. They're, they're thinking what their thought process was is, oh, oh, we understand we're naked. We're going to maybe, maybe God won't notice if we sew these fig leaves together. Okay, I don't have time for that, Marcy. She's a, Fig is related to Israel, and I, I, I do know that. And, but I want to get this out. So uh, I don't want people blaming you if I go long, Marcy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. Stop. Stop it, Daryl. Stop it. So we know that after God discovered Adam and Eve as sin, he, he killed some animals and made skins for them to cover their nakedness. He was really, he killed the animals and made the skins to cover their sin. Are you listening to me? You can read about it in Genesis 3.21. I'm not going there. So God made the first animal sacrifice for man. And their nakedness represented their sin and God covered their sin. Are you listening? And we know that Adam's sons, Cain and Abel, both brought sacrifices to God. Is that right? You remember? Anybody know the story? Cain and Abel, two brothers, Adam and Eve's kids. And uh, Abel, what did Abel bring? He made a blood sacrifice. He killed a, some, a lamb and presented that to the father. What did Cain do? Cain brought some crops. Not that they're not good or, or anything like that, but he offered his crops to God. But what does the Bible say? God, Cain's offering wasn't acceptable. I believe that God had told them, given them some instructions, not written down, but they knew that Cain knew he was supposed to, he just didn't want to humble himself and go buy or ask for a sheep, in my opinion. It's my opinion, this isn't Bible, but, and that, will, because he didn't offer a blood sacrifice, it wasn't accepted by God. And then he got upset. You know, his pride got the best of him. He went and killed his brother, and then we all know that story. But. So anyway, I'm, where I'm getting at is this blood covenant, it goes down from the beginning of time, from the beginning of God's dealing with Adam and Eve. And uh, I, I'm reading a new book. It's really difficult to understand because it was written way back in the 1800s, but it's Dr. H. Clay Trumbull. He has a book called The Blood Covenant, and it's bearing on scripture. And this guy has researched, researched hundreds of tribes and primitive peoples. And he wrote a 400 page book on it. And the book is called The Blood Covenant and it's bearing on scripture. And he showed that there had been a blood covenant practiced by all primitive peoples from the beginning of time. Can you imagine that? And uh, he also proved in this book that the blood covenant was the basis for all primitive religions. Isn't that interesting? And uh, you remember now, the Bible is a Middle Eastern book. This took place, I mean, Abraham, where was he? He was like in where it's Iran and Syria and uh, Israel. It's a Middle Eastern book. And... Uh, so what I'm saying is they knew about blood covenants because all the primitive peoples of the, of the world, Dr. Clay H., Dr. H. Clay Trumbull says, I'll just read this, he, he also proved that blood, the blood covenant was the basis of all primitive religions and he, gave, he gives examples in this book from all parts of the world showing that even to this day in Africa, in India, in China, in the Middle East, in Borneo, and the islands of the seas showing that men are practicing a blood covenant very similar to the Lord's Supper. Now listen, they're not worshiping God with it. They're not cutting a covenant with God. But, let me just go on.
But what he has done is he says uh, to, to me, this proves that something has been passed down from Adam and Eve. They knew something about the blood covenant, and it's been passed down to everybody since then has that knowledge of the blood covenant, these primitive peoples. Now, in the Western world, we don't do it that way anymore because it's not politically correct. Are you listening to me? Are you listening? Plus, who wants to bloody up their office by saying, let's cut a business deal? So anyway, in the 1800s, now listen, I know it's kind of a history lesson, different kind of sermon, but in the 1800s, anybody heard of Dr. Livingston? He had gone missing in Africa in the 1800s. I mean, there's no phones, there's nothing. They don't know how to communicate. But uh, a group sent, doc, sent Henry Stanley, he was an explorer. He had explored the continent of Africa. Uh, he had been there many times. And so they sent him and they said, hey, would you go? This is where Dr. Livingston was going. Would you go and find him? So Henry Stanley went, he was an explorer, and he tracked down, he actually found and rescued Dr. Livingston. And uh, there uh, used to be, you don't hear it anymore, it was a famous statement saying, Dr. Livingston, I presume. Yeah, because he's the only white man in, a bunch, in the Afri nation of Africa. So uh, Henry Stanley was an explorer who found and rescued Dr. Livingston. During his travels in Africa, listen to me, Stanley said that he had to cut a blood covenant with over 50 African tribes so that he could have peace while he was exploring. He cut a blood covenant with the chiefs of over 50 tribes in Africa. And so uh, we need to look at that word covenant. The Hebrew word for covenant, does anybody know what it means? I was thinking Marcy might. The Hebrew word for covenant means to cut. It literally means to cut. It suggests cut and incision until the blood flows. And practically everywhere where that, that word covenant is in the Bible, it means to cut the covenant. Everywhere you see it, it means to cut the covenant. Blood, it should remind you. It sh when you read it now and you see that word covenant, blood flowed. It means blood flowed. So, the blood covenant, or what we call communion, or the Lord's Supper, or the Lord's Table, is based upon the oldest known covenant in the human family. It's the oldest known covenant, the oldest no, known uh, a contractual agreement in, the, in mankind's history. Did you get that? So if God chose to use the blood covenant in his dealings with man, we can be assured that God himself believes it's the most powerful and binding agreement in creation. There is no more powerful or binding agreement than a blood covenant. Are you listening? It evidently began in the Garden of Eden, and it's evident that God cut the covenant or entered into a covenant with Adam at the very beginning, and research shows there isn't a primitive people or tribe in the world as far as we know that has not practiced the blood covenant in some form, showing that it had a God-given or origin. I'm going someplace with this. And so man practiced the covenant in some form or another all through the ages. Are you listening to me? And it's important. How many know it's important that we take all scripture in the context in which it was written? Do you know that's important? And uh, you can get doctrinally off if you just twist the scriptures to mean what you want. There are preachers that do that. That's why it's up to you to go back and say, did, what did Pastor Darrell say? Does that, is that what that says in this word? Is that what it says? Is that in the context of what it says? So we know the Bible's God's redemptive plan for man. Isn't that right? Have we established that? And the redemptive plan of man all swings about two covenants. Is that right? The old and the new? And they're both what kind of covenants? Blood, you guys are quick today. Blood covenants. We have an old covenant 
and a new covenant, and both covenants required blood to flow. We can say that the, context, the whole context of the Bible is a blood covenant. When you read this, we should read it in the context that it was written. It was written, this is a blood covenant. This is a blood covenant book. So that covenant, what a covenant means and what it is, when we're reading the Bible, that ought to be the context in which we're reading every scripture. That this is, I got a, I got a covenant with God. This shows me what that means. This shows me my responsibilities. This shows me the promises that God made to me. Are you listening? Come on. Stir yourself up if you're not. So that said, what is the purpose of cutting a covenant or making a blood covenant? I'm glad that you asked. There are three reasons. There's three reasons. One, if a strong tribe lives by the side of a weaker tribe, and there is danger of the weaker tribe being destroyed, the weaker tribe will, will try to cut a covenant with the stronger tribe that they may be preserved or saved. Are you listening? Number two, if two businessmen are entering into a partnership, they might cut a covenant to ensure that neither would take advantage of the other. Did you get that one? Three, this is all in a book called The Blood Covenant by E.W. Kenyon. If two men loved each other as much as David and Jonathan, or as much as God loved man, as much as God loved man, Amen. if two men loved each other as much as David and Jonathan, or as much as God loved man, they would cut a covenant for that love's sake. The covenant was cut for love's sake. So, how is the covenant cut? I want you to pay attention to this. There's a reason. The Bible is a Middle Eastern book. Covenant was practiced in Africa and in the Middle East. The covenant that was practiced in Africa and in the Middle East was along these lines. This is how they did it. Two men wished to cut a covenant. They would come together. They'd get their family. They'd get their friends. They'd get witnesses. And, uh, uh, and they would bring a priest First, they exchanged gifts. Why did they exchange gifts? By this exchange, they indicated that all that one has, the other now owns if necessary. I'm going to say that again. They exchanged the gifts to show that all, I'm cutting a covenant. I'm cutting a covenant with you. I bring you gifts. You bring me gifts. And what we're saying is, hey, everything, all of my resources are at your disposal if you need it. You're saying all of my resources, who I am, is at your disposal if you need it. That's, that's, what they, that's the first part of the covenant. Next, listen to this. This is how they practice the covenant in the Middle East. Next, they bring a cup of wine. Does that remind you of something? The Lord's Supper. Listen to this. They would bring a cup of wine and the priest would make an incision into the arm of each man. I don't know where they cut wrist, arm, it says in the arm. Probably like right in here. And then they would let their blood drip into the cup of wine. They would cut the covenant each man would just let that blood drip into the cup of wine. This is how they made the covenant in the Middle East. And uh, then the, the priest would stir the cup, make sure that their bloods were mingled in with the wine. And then the cup is handed to one man, and he drinks about half of it, handed to the other man, he drinks the rest of it. They drink it down. Lastly, they would touch their wounds together and let their blood mix, or listen to me, or they would touch their tongue to the wound of the other man and vice versa. I know. See, that's the Western mind. 
it is our Western mindset. That's disgusting. But that's how they did it in the Middle East. This all has bearing. And then at times, they would even put some gunpowder into that wound because then when it healed, there'd be a black mark, like a tattoo there. And that black mark was their reminder. Oh, I have a covenant with so-and-so. I have a covenant. I have a covenant. And now they have become blood brothers. Listen to me. Uh, Stanley, the explorer, and both Stanley and Dr. Livingston both said, listen to me, they had never known a blood covenant to be broken in Africa no matter what the provocation. They had never known a blood covenant to be broken. Never known it to be broken. That's among men. That's not God and man. They had never known a blood covenant to be broken, ever. It was indissoluble. It could not be dissolved. It could not be done away with. Are you listening? And after the covenant was cut, even the vilest of enemies became trusted friends. No man could take advantage of the other or break the covenant. No man could take advantage of the other or break the covenant. It was so sacred that the children to the third and fourth generations revered it and kept it. Are you listening? In other words, it's a perpetual covenant. It can never be annulled. And from that time on, it's always in force. Are you listening? So there's power even in natural men's covenants. I mean, there's power in a natural covenant. But as I said, for some reason, for the reason of redemption, for the reason of redemption, God chose to cut the blood covenant with man. And there was another uh, uh, step in that covenant. I'm not going to get into it. I think I'm going to skip over that. But they would pronounce blessings and curses. That type of thing. You know, Moses had blessing, a guy on a mountain yelling the curses and a guy on the opposite mountain yelling the blessings. You can get all into that. Deuteronomy, I think it's 11 and 27. Deuteronomy 28 lists the blessings and the curses. But uh, So this is, this is the facts of a real blood covenant. The moment a covenant is solemnized, Everything that a blood covenant man or brother, everything he owns in the world is at the disposal of his blood brother if he needs it. I said everything he owns, everything, everything that he possesses is at the disposal of his blood brother if he needs it. Yet, the blood brother, this brother would never ask for it unless it was absolute of an absolute necessity unless he was driven to do it. The moment the covenant was cut, they were recognized as blood brothers, and they're called blood brothers. You see, it's so important for us to realize this. Because you remember, we're gonna, I'm going to read the scripture about, about the Last Supper, but you remember the Last Supper. And Jesus told them, he said, hey, this is, he had a cup of wine. He had the bread. He had a cup of wine. He said, this cup is the blood of the new covenant I'm making with you. Every apostle there, they were like, what, what in the world is he talking about? They weren't, they weren't wondering what he's talking about. They knew what a blood covenant was in the Middle East. They were familiar with it. In fact, the reason you can tell they knew what was going on because they didn't say a word. They accepted it. They realized Jesus is cutting a covenant with us. He's saying this cup, you know, he didn't, he didn't cut himself and drip his blood in there, but he poured out his blood on Calvary for us. He was wounded uh, uh, for our transgressions. Chastisement of our peace was upon him. Amen? Amen. But Jesus said, this is the cup of the covenant I'm cutting with you. 
Jesus has the scars in himself of the, that covenant. Amen. And he said, I am offering myself as your substitute in this covenant. Mm -hmm. And so when we, when we partake of the communion supper, we're supposed to remember that the apostles knew exactly what he was saying. He was saying, I'm cutting a covenant with you. Everything that my father has, everything that I have will be available to you. And so in this day and age, the new covenant operates all by faith. So you don't have to come up to the front of the church and I don't have to get a cup of wine. I got to say, okay, today we're going to cut your arm. You're going to drip it in and now you become a Christian. Jesus was our substitute. He offered his blood to the Father in our stead, just as if it was us offering our blood. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then he said to the disciples, remember this. Every time you take of this cup, you remember. I shed my blood for you. I shed my blood for you so that you have right standing with my Father. So that you can come before God just as though you never sinned. The truth of the matter is you can come before God just as though you were Jesus. He gave you his righteousness. Are you listening? Do you have... Could we, could we pass out the elements? Do you... I, does that give you a better understanding of what a blood covenant is? And this is the thing. This is the thing that gets me. God initiated it. God said, I love you so much. I can't stand being apart from you. And if you'll accept my son Jesus and accept his blood sacrifice, we will have Right, you'll have right standing with me. I will restore you to the same fellowship that I had with Adam and Eve in the garden. Come on! And here's the thing. We need to act like it. You need to talk to God just like, you know, I don't have any problem having a conversation with my son John. I just, we just talk whatever we're talking about. We don't. I don't think we hold back much. We just talk about it. I know that his brothers and sister, they don't hold anything back when they're talking with him. I see their text even when they get on the angry side. Are you listening? And God desires to have intimate fellowship with each of us. And that's why he shed his blood. Are you listening? So today, let me just read... While they're passing that out, I'll read this. Paul said this about communion, and he said he got this from the Lord himself. Wasn't told it by the apostles. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three through 31. Remember, Paul wasn't there at the Last Supper. He says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. Jesus himself told Paul about this. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord, took, the Lord Jesus took some bread, this is Passion Translation, gave thanks for it and broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after, uh, after the supper, he took the cup of wine, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood. It's a blood covenant, blood agreement. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death till he comes again. We're remembering it. This is like the gunpowder in the wound. This is, a, this is something that we have that we can look and say, oh, Jesus cut a covenant with me. I have, a, I have a blood covenant with Almighty God. So, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning on the body and blood of the Lord. Let me tell you this. 
Jesus appeared to my father in the faith, Brother Kenneth E. Hagen. And when he appeared to Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Hagen fell on the floor weeping. He, he, he fell, just fell on the floor weeping and sobbing and saying, I'm so unworthy. I'm so unworthy. I'm so unworthy. Just weeping and sobbing, saying, I'm so unworthy. This is what Brother Hagen said. He said, Jesus reached down. He grabbed me by the shoulders. He picked me up. He put his finger in my face and he said, I made you worthy. Jesus was upset that Brother Hagen wasn't honoring the blood. He wasn't honoring the blood and what it did for him. Not by works of righteousness, which you've done, but according to God's mercy, he saved us. So, when we take communion, if you got any of that unworthiness in you, you let it, you judge, you say, you know what, I am not taking this in an unworthy manner. I am going to honor the blood. God says I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. His word says that. The blood purchased it for me. And so I'm not going to take this in an unworthy manner. I'm going to believe that Jesus made me worthy. I didn't make myself worthy. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. But Jesus made me worthy. And so you never have to approach God like you're unworthy. When we do, we're not honoring the blood. I said, if you have that attitude, you're not honoring the blood. Are you listening? And when you honor the blood, you give space for the Holy Spirit to flow in your life. Are you listening? That's why you should examine yourself before you eat and drink the cup. For if you eat and drink the cup of the Lord without honoring the body, the blood of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Listen to this. I, I, I mean, I didn't write this. This is why many of you are weak and sick and as some have even died. What's the reason? You tell me. What's the reason? They're not honoring. Not honoring the body and the blood. Got a wrong mentality. They're thinking, oh, I'm not worthy and oh, I got to suffer because I'm just not perfect. And... But if we examine ourselves, we shouldn't be judged by God in this way. Listen, what I do is, if you don't know, we already know. Uh, you know, I, I, I told you about Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, 8, right? But it's God to give you power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant with you. That he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day, as it is right now. God swore a covenant to us. If you don't know what's in that covenant, you need to learn it. That's why you need to read this Bible. Because things will just shock you. But he said he'll meet all of our needs according to your rich, his riches and glory. So as you're taking this, if you have needs that aren't met, you just need to tell God about it. And Lord, I remember, I got a covenant with you. Lord, I have this need. And you said, everything you have is at my disposal. Was made available to me through this sacrifice. If you have a sickness in your body, the Bible says that by his stripes, we were healed. That was part and parcel of the atonement process. You know, when they took the Passover land, they had three million men, and they said there wasn't one feeble among them. Not even an old, you know, they had nobody feeble. So that's the, that's, that's the mark that we're pressing towards. Now we deal in a fallen world. I understand all that stuff. I'm not getting into that. But if you have a sickness or something that's plaguing you, when you take that, remind the Lord, this has been bothering me. And today, I'm remembering that I have a blood covenant with you. Are you listening? That's how God, that's honoring. That is honoring what Jesus did for us. That's how you honor it. You remind him. You, you know, he did, he initiated this whole thing. He did it for you and for me. And when we remind him of that, Lord, you know, I, I got a blood covenant with you. Because honestly, there ain't a whole lot from us naturally speaking, that he needs. 
But he covets our fellowship. He covets our worship. Come on. That's, what he, that's what's in it for him. He loves you that much that he's like, man. If they only knew, if the world only knew. If the world only knew. That, all, that God is like, man, I love you so much if you only knew. Are you ready to partake and remind ourselves of the covenant Jesus cut with us? Come on.